my first two years in Australia. Um, I wasn't going to talk about the fact that, um, you know, the scale and size is a bit different. So I'm not going to tell you the fact that you can fit the UK in New South Wales, where I live and work three times, and actually 32 times in Australia, which I couldn't actually fit in my slide because it was too, too big. But I was going to, I'm not going to tell you about that. Um, I was going to tell you about Sydney, uh, which is really um, Sydney. You've probably been there. Most people do. It's a great place to visit. Uh, but it is one of the biggest urban cities in the world. In fact, if you start off in the north and head uh, on a car or train journey, you see housing and development for 100 kilometres. It's probably bigger uh, than London in many respects. It's only 4.5 million people, but boy, is it growing and growing very fast. They, uh, they expect by 2031 to have 5.9 million people in there, and uh, what's happening is you're seeing two phenomena in this city. People spreading south, west, and a little bit north um, with new houses on what Aussies call their acres uh, of development with plenty of land. I expect to be in their brand new Holden or European car driving around everywhere. And then you're seeing another phenomenon, which is places like Woolai Creek and the old offices being converted to brownfield residential accommodation right in the centre of town. And it really is a mirror image of perhaps some of the challenges that London faced as well. And I do think that the sort of experience we've had is that we're going to see another million people join us in the next 10 years. And there's no way that they can do what they do today is drive to and from work. When you reflect on the mirror image of London and actually of Sydney, in this great city, 27% um, of people roughly go by public transport and the rest, barring a few cyclists, um, go by car. Whereas London, I think, and certainly many global cities in Europe, it's the opposite way around, where about 20 odd percent of people travel by a private vehicle and seven, over 70% of people travel by, by uh, public transport. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon, I, I'll get misquoted for this, but Australia is a country, but it's not really, because most of the decisions made are made by the state, a state of New South Wales. Certainly when it comes to public transport, the federal government is great at building roads and maybe supporting rail freight, but provides little if no funding for public transport. That all comes from the state. And another interesting stat is that um, it's great to see Andy, actually, because Mexico, then followed by the US and then Canada, has the lowest taxation on fuel, which is the fourth lowest OECD country, is Australia, where we're still paying about 80 pence a litre for wonderful fuel, and that's why they all drive around in V8s and uh, big cars. Now, um, for you railway people, I'm sure there's many in the audience, just have a little nostalgic reflection back on what... Uh, Signal and Collins is there. It could be Leighton Stone Signal Frame, a mini lever frame, Westinghouse. Um, that's what it's like. And in fact, that's one of our newer ones. Because on Mount Victoria, I have an 1870 uh, lever, you know, big lever frame with mechanical locking. Um, I've got heritage listed wooden escalators, which Mike told me we got rid of the last one in the underground many years ago. Maybe Greenford's gone recently. We still have a lot of those at our biggest stations. And would you believe this train was built in 1980-something? It looks like a New York subway from the 1950s. And a half of the fleet is sort of um, modern, and the other half looks a little bit like that. And I have been quoted as saying, yes, it is a little bit like going behind 25 years ago. But behind that physical visibility, there is a lot of great things going on. But what was my first day like? The embankment arriving on platform four... That's why we do say stand behind the yellow line, by the way. <laughs> Luckily, it happened during engineering hours when that was closed. This is Harris Park. It was the night before I started my job. Um, so what did I look like the next day? <laughs> Press conference. What are you, Mr Collins, going to do about this? I quietly thought to myself, well, this is Railcorp dirt. It's not mine. 
But what I did see was the first thing which inspired me, I better move that on, it's frightening. The first thing inspired me was Aussie innovation. In fact, if I go, go back a couple, they are good at shifting dirt. All you Australians in the audience, you should be very proud of the fact if this was network rail, bless us, or London Underground, I think that would have taken us longer than about four days to shift, repair, put back, and run the trains again. And I think that's something about the inno sort of innovative, the sort of nature, they, they can't wait for the colonies to send them a spare part, or whatever now they've got in their blood, they are now saying, we better get on with it. So when it fell down, that was all cleared up in about four or five days. So I was very proud of them. What I'm trying to do now, and what we are focusing on, and Andy Byford, myself, and many others are exports, uh, uh, what's the standard called a brain drain, but I'm not sure whether it was my brain, maybe half a brain drain. Um, what we have done is we've actually sing from the same song sheet, and we really do believe it. We are a customer-led organisation. Well, let's say we're aspiring to be a customer-led organisation. And as an operator, I can claim that, you know, all we were interested in sometimes in the bad days of London Underground was about looking at red lights, moaning that customers or passengers got in the way of trying to run a decent railway and actually operating everything around, the, around that operational mantra. And whilst I do believe, still believe in core railway operations, you've got to get things at the centre, which is the customer, and the staff, which is the jam in this fantastic sandwich, which actually then gets you the sort of service product and the train. And we are building a $170 million rail operations centre uh, with that mantra that it's not actually being run by the guy who's in charge of operations, it's run by the people who do customer service, and that's really important. So we are on a, a path, but as Pete Waterman would say, you know, it is about the people, it's the apprentices, it's the people in it, and we have another thing which I'm very proud of, the fact that our staff just needed, through a lot of good work that Rob Mason did before me, but just needed to have a new identity, a new sense of purpose and driving forward. Uh, maybe, yes, new uniform, maybe, yes, some great technology, but needed to feel that they were at the centre of things we do. Getting them out, as Andy called them, booze, getting them involved in the customer <coughs> action. And of course, in Australia, in Sydney, the average age is 34. It's a, you know, about the size, average age of this audience, really, isn't it? I mean, something like that. But the average age brings innovation technology. There are so many Australians who are literally stuck to their smartphones. But what is great about it is that it brings innovation. And what we are finding is our, our customers are knowing more about the service and what was going on. And, um, we said, well, we've got to do this for our staff. You know, rather than getting a phone call from the line controller saying the train is late, when the customers had that information at their fingertips. So we have armed not only our staff with new uniforms and a way of dealing with customer service, but also technology. So I've helped Apple profits by a little bit by ordering 10,000 iPads and iPhones. I've said to the management, you no longer have to be the only person to have a flashy iPhone 6. Every one of our staff including the guards and the drivers, will be equipped, equipped with this information, which will be useful for them, which will actually be a simple app or something that you can use so you can get good information or get, it, get things going. And um, the staff have taken it like a duck to water. Um, one thing when I arrived in uh, Central Station, which is uh, a little like a mini Grand Central with 25 platforms, there was an excuse of a little TV monitor in the corner telling you where trains went. But thanks to some great guys and some really collaborative work with Transport for New South Wales, we now have our equivalent of a visitor centre, the Travel Information Place, and above it, a Waterloo or a Euston-type feeling about where trains are going. And customers now migrate there and feel we're actually running a place we're in charge of as opposed to uh, trying to scurry around for information. And uh, I think that can get the footy up as well, I'm not sure, or or something else, but actually it's a useful piece of information for our customers that we're very proud of. And how have we done? Well, in two years, we've gone uh, from 78 to 88%. I think that took a little longer on the tube, maybe five or so years. And what have we done to achieve that? Well, we've done a few things. We've taken maintenance centres from 100, 
27 B&Q sheds uh, who had their own little uh, fiefdoms of armchairs and their own uh, strimmers to cut their own bit of grass into 12 centres of excellence which do maintenance with 500 less staff but actually no backlog of maintenance and improved performance. We've got great new trains, the Waratah trains for half our fleet, double deck trains, really good reliable trains and through Transport for New South Wales not being on the bleeding edge of technology which some last ticketing system fell flat on its face in Sydney a few years ago. We decided to use something with the letter O. It's not an oyster, it's not an octopus, but it's an opal. And uh, this is a really success story. Uh, about 75% of the people are in Sydney are now using it online. We don't sell it through ticket offices, so we are able to close them more quickly than perhaps in London. And that is going well as a product. And finally, we have continued to open. This is one of our newest stations on the Leppington branch, and we're starting to see some investment. But as far as I'm concerned, we still have a challenge on our hands. We still have a challenge of greater and greater congestion. The story is the same whether you're in London or Sydney. We still have the challenge of things happening to us. Tony Ede, my ops director, said, Howard, this is a once-in-a-lifetime moment in weather. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not a ferry terminal. That is one of my stations, I think Barbwell Park. That's a once-in-a-lifetime generation which has happened so far twice in a year since I've been there. Um, and uh, that when the tide comes in, this is what happens. But four hours later, when the tide went out, we were running again because of the guys and girls who actually, in those maintenance centres, uh, knew what to do and dealt with it. We've got great new trains which are helping. We have a challenge, though. Double-deck trains are fantastic at shifting lots of people, but boy, dwell time is a headache. No one wants to go up and down stairs, and I think I will explain to you in a minute why we're moving on to three types of rail system in Sydney. We focused on some very basic things in Sydney. We've decided to ensure that people understand that we have to build our railway around this great city which is growing. That's Barangaroo. It's a sort of mini Canary Wharf. Um, has no rail station near it, um, but we'll have one fairly soon once we start building the second part of the Sydney Metro. It's a city which is growing all the time and certainly we're seeing a massive, massive use in public transport going up. We've seen growth of about 8 to 9% in the last two and a half years and we expect people to be switching to our system. The problem is, like Network Rail and London, if we're so successful attracting people back onto the network, we need more capacity in many, many areas. We need simple things. I walked around Sydney for the first few weeks trying to find the entrance to any station. The locals knew where it was, but eventually we worked out you might need a bit of signing to tell you what it is. And if it's in London, I'm afraid we've got an apologetic T. It's not as sexy as the, the roundel, but it's starting to make people realise there is a system there they can use. So let me talk about a number of things. I want to give you a little flavour. We are heavy rail. I look after a railway which moves about 330 million people around uh, 300 million people, growing to 330 around the CB CBD, but the metropolitan network. We also have a lot of freight, but this is a first for Australia. This is, was called Sydney Rapid Transit, now called Sydney Metro. It's being built as, as we speak, and it's going to make a massive difference because it's bringing in things that you probably all yawn about, things like automatic trains, driverless trains, platform screen doors, taking over some of our network to give a turn up and go 20, 25, eventually 30 trains an hour service. This is the first bit being built now, will be open in 2018-19. Um, uh, by the way, Crossrail, I think it's on budget and on time as well, so we're doing okay. Um, and it will bring people as far as a place called Chatswood. And when I got to Australia, I discovered that the next phase to get it through the CBD was way in the distance, 2029. So every opportunity I've been saying is just hijack those tunnel boring machines, just keep going, you've got to go through the city. Government was elected last May, re-elected, and they have now authorised and started 
the work, and this is a, a drilling rig looking for the best place to get the tunnel under the, the harbour, um, started this second part of the journey. And this is the sexy bit. This is our cross rail, but going north to south. And it's going, hopefully, under Barangaroo, once we get the sort of uh, green light for that. Tube, double bore, deep tube, all the way through, under Central Station, and then out Sydenham, and then takes over our Bankstown line. This will be the first in Australia, will make a massive difference, and I think will increase our capacity by something like 30 to 40%. And that will be it in its entirety. But the philosophy we have is that Sydney will consist of heavy rail, which you can see in those orange areas. You can see um, what we call suburban, the metro network growing, creating a sort of tube sort of uh, style approach, and then followed obviously by the intercity trains which come in from places like Newcastle, um, down at Wollongong, and even further afield from Brisbane and Melbourne. Light rail. Sydney had the biggest light rail or tram network in the Southern Hemisphere. Massive. Those are the halcyon days. Uh, we're building a light rail down the busiest street. This is like putting light rail down Oxford Street. There are a lot of naysayers saying it's never going to work, it's going to destroy the city, but it's got to happen. And it's happening from this October. That project is starting in earnest and will be ready in the next few years. It really will be an artery which is so valuable to the city of, of Sydney. And there's an artist impression. Notice today you'll find buses queued end to end with cars uh, end to end. Here it's going to change the whole feel of the CBD in a sort of plaza type approach where people feel a lot like a global city as opposed to one behind the times. We have freight. Um, you imagine on the circle line, uh, you're waiting for your train for Tower Hill. Uh, it, so for me, it is almost like uh, the third train will come up, iron ore train. And then two kilometers later, this train will come through with four locomotives uh, through and then you're saying, right, um, okay, we're waiting for the next train. Yeah, that's a circle. For me, my mantra is I love fr freight. I think it's great. Um, it is often late. But um, I want to do something which we have started in, in New South Wales, is segregating the lines. Just like the North London line suffers from freight delays, we have the same problem with coal trains going through one of my busiest corridors for suburban network. And they don't mix. The debate for us is, should we go for the European train control system? Oh, yeah, that does everything, but doesn't give us very much capacity. Shall we go for CBTC? Oh, well, that's a you know, closed system. Will cross-rail work is one of my questions, because you've got CBDC in the middle and, and uh, something at the other end which is not quite ready yet, and we'll see how that happens. So I'm very interested in that, and we need it for freight. High-speed trains in Australia, very sexy, you know, Brisbane, Melbourne, but being a realist, the business case for 100 and something billion dollars of, of, of expenditure for 23 million people, where airfares are about $100 a pop, I see the money being spent on shortening journeys, uh, which zigzag through the uh, suburban network of, of uh, New South Wales, and Kieran Richards is here today, where an average journey on a, you know, London to Brighton or St Albans uh, it would take you two and a half hours on our network because the chain literally chases its tail as it go, goes up the Cowan Bank, followed by a failed freight train occasionally, maybe. So high-speed trains in Australia will come uh, when we've imported all you guys from uh, the UK, by the way. Um, but it will come, but we have got to spend time and effort on um, the network as it exists. There's the progress shot in town. I'll just give you one last one because I'm finishing up now. Um, my guard on this train, or similar train, summed it up when, he, when we were travelling over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. He said to the uh, customers, ladies and gentlemen, the next station is Mil you know, Milson's Point. But can you, before you do that, put down your iPads and your iPhones. Just look outside to your right. This is the best rail view in the whole of the world. One of my two examples of failures in the airport railway world is Sydney. Uh, the station operator, as I remember, went bankrupt. Uh, served by double-deck trains, which the air passengers hate. 
uh, especially when they arrive at, uh, in, in the rush hour and there's no room for their luggage. Are things getting better, please? I, I, I would completely dispute that. I, I, Sydney has the best rail airport connection in the world. 15 minutes to go from your, almost as you come through the gate, into CBD. You don't get that in Melbourne, you don't even get that in Heathrow Express on a good day. Brand new Waratah trains which go through there most of the time. There's a pretty good space. Yes, the financial model was flawed, but now we've got more control of it. I actually am very proud of the city. One of my challenges is they want to build a new airport in Badgerys Creek, 60 kilometres or 80 kilometres away from Western Sydney. You've got to get into town, you've got to get to Parramatta, places like that. So we must have a rail system to support that as well. But no, I'm afraid I'm a great advocate. And, and if you ever go to Sydney, do not get a taxi. Don't quote me on this, please. But do not get a taxi. Um, jump on the train and you'll get wherever you want to do in 15 minutes. Anthony Oliver from Infrastructure Intelligence. Presumably, uh, how with your experience of running the track and the train... Uh, in Sydney, your advice to, uh, to Peter Hendy would be to uh, follow that model? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm biased. You know, I spent 35 years, uh, most of it on the tube. I love the fact that there was the vertical integration meant there was no one else to blame or have consultants or, or, or commercial people pointing at each other, knock on knock, talk on talk, wherever it is. Um, I know that I'm not going to work perfectly in the UK, but I do like the Southwest train model of of merging the two together and have creating it, even if it's a virtual one team. Sydney is vertically integrated, but we also have our colleagues from New South Wales trains coming through and we've got to support them as a, as a customer and freight as well. But creating that sense of ownership rather than blaming everyone else is the important message. One thing I'd say, Kirsty, feel proud of what you do here because you do deliver fantastic stuff. Just get on and do it. <laughs>